Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, yeah, so uh, good morning everyone. It's a little after 11 here um, in California. I just want to welcome you to this presentation of the Best of the Best webinar series brought to you by No Veg. Uh, my name is Vince and I'll sort of be emceeing for today. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. We're really excited not only to present our Landis, but to have uh, Chris Stringer on board to present with us. Just a little background on Chris before we get started here. Um, he's the general manager of Objects Online, Advent's Atlantis distributor in the U.S. and Canada. Trained as an architect, Chris has been involved in architectural software sales training and support since 1996. His specific interests are 3D visualization and 3D parametric modeling. So needless to say, he's truly the best guy we could get to give us a webinar on Atlantis. So we're truly fortunate to have him on board with us. Chris is going to speak for about the next 40 minutes or so. During that time, everyone will be in listen-only mode. But please feel free to send your questions into the question box on the right-hand side of your panel. Afterwards, we'll open it up for a Q&A. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. Um, we will be recording this webinar, so it will be made available to all of you. I'll give complete details on where to find it um, as soon as we're done. But having said that, I want to turn it over to Chris so we can get to as much of his presentation as possible. Chris, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, hear you loud and clear. I'm going to switch the screen over to you and we'll get started. Great. So let me know when you can see my screen and we'll be all set. Okay, everything look good? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let me jump into, uh, I'm going to try to go very light on the PowerPoint today, but I am going to use it to kind of guide my uh, discussion uh, today, so hopefully this is going to work out. Can you see everything okay on the screen here? Yeah, it's taking a minute to load here. Um, one second. We good? Yeah, it should. There we go, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So uh, today's uh, <coughs> webinar, as as discussed, was is the Artlantis rendering parameters. Uh, this is a uh, presentation organized around specifically the rendering features of Artlantis. There are quite a few other features of Artlantis, and anybody who has been watching Artlantis for a while now uh, is probably aware that just recently, about a week ago, Avid made an announcement uh, introducing version 4 to the world. So that's a brand new version with a lot of new improvements, a lot of new features. However, that will not be the topic of uh, the discussion today. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, the rendering capabilities of Artlantis and really go in depth into a lot of the settings uh, that you're going to encounter in Artlantis. And, um, and then we'll try to cover, uh, you know, what some of the different settings can do in terms of affecting rendering time and whatnot. So um, let's take it away. Um, I'm going to jump out of this presentation. We'll jump in directly into Artlantis and have a look at the interface here. And uh, so I'll just point out a few things in the layout if you're unfamiliar with Artlantis to kind of uh, give you a, a feel for what's here, what's available. Um, <clears throat> this is the main window that you use in Artlantis. This is the preview window, which gives you your real-time feedback and uh, gives you an idea of what the final rendering is going to look like. Um, so um, as you're navigating through Artlantis, you're going to use this palette uh, pretty regularly. This is the inspector palette, which uh, you can choose between several different types of inspectors. There's uh, materials, lights, sun settings, object settings and uh, the camera settings, which is the palette we're going to be focusing on today. Now, you notice this palette, we've got a pull down here with several different sub palettes, uh, and we'll get to those later, but just to keep in mind that this is where you're going to do a lot of your navigation <coughs> uh, to get to the uh, settings of a specific project. Um, so let's talk about briefly here um, the uh, what you can do here with this render button, just to give you an idea when you click on it, 
uh, you can choose this button here in the uh, in the preview window, or you can go up to the inspector palette and choose render uh, from that menu. It's the same thing. And what you're going to see here are some options. Uh, and you're you know we're about to render this uh, this project, uh, this particular view of the project, this perspective we have selected in this list of perspectives that we've set up for this project. So you can see there are some options for choosing uh, your file format, uh, whether you're going to render the project, the render this rendering now or later, and then we can get into some more uh, options for <coughs> uh, the rendering as we go in and fine tune our settings. And we'll talk more about these uh, settings in depth as the presentation continues. But one thing I want to point out here up front is that the real-time rendering uh, interface in Artlantis, this preview window, is all happening, as I said, in real time, but it's also giving you a radiosity view of the project. Now, Artlantis, uh, its claim to fame is its a fabulous rendering, uh, radiosity rendering engine, and the real-time uh, 3D preview window, which gives you uh, true to uh, uh, true to, let's say, final uh, presentation uh, preview of, of what you're going to get. And just to prove that, I'm going to pull up a, a pre-rendered uh, image. This was something that was rendered in Artlantis uh, uh, before the presentation, just to give you an idea of a side-by-side -side comparison between the final output here on the left and what you're seeing in the preview window on the right. So that really gives you a very good, uh, you know, as as I said, true to finished product kind of uh, preview in that uh, uh, preview window. So as we're making changes to the uh, the project, you're going to see uh, things happening in real time in this preview window. Um, so let's talk quickly about this render zone tool. This is an option you can use to if you uh, just want to kind of preview a certain area of the project and not the entire project. You can pull this tool up, and it'll give you a little uh, icon to indicate you're in the render zone. And you can just uh, <coughs> marquee off, off a certain portion of the project, and then Artlantis will get to work rendering just that portion. If you just want to spot check something, let's say, before you're going to do a final rendering, uh, or just to you know preview the materials on something or the shading or, or whatnot, this gives you a real quick way to, uh, to isolate that portion of the rendering and, and uh, get some real-time feedback. So in just a matter of seconds, we've got that little uh, portion of the uh, rendering, uh, a final rendering of that uh, done. So uh, I'm going to close that image. Um, and we're going to move on to uh, some, some options that we have in uh, the perspective inspector. Uh, and if we click on this gear icon here, this is where we can pull up the rendering parameters. So right now what we see here is a reduced set of uh, some of the rendering uh, parameters that we can choose, um, including uh, you can designate uh, from a variety of different preset sizes, uh, which are commonly used, uh, or you can specify your own uh, width and height and pixels for uh, the rendering that's about to be created. Um, let's just, uh, for the heck of it here, let's go ahead and change this uh, size of the rendering. Let's disconnect this and change the size of the rendering slightly. So instead of 1200 by 800, we've switched it to uh, uh, 1200 by 600. And you should see that change reflected in the preview then. You'll see that aspect ratio change to match uh, the setting that you indicated in the, uh, uh, the settings there. So let's jump back in there. Um, and, and talk about some of the additional settings. Now you'll see uh, we've got uh, resolution indicated here, uh, printing size. Uh, we can choose different levels of anti-aliasing, uh, which smooths the jagged edges that you see in the preview window so that the final output uh, it presents a much smoother looking uh, rendering, although uh, most of the qualities of the rendering in the preview window are do remain intact in the final rendering. And then we have a couple of uh, radiosity uh, computational presets that uh, do different things in the rendering. They adjust the accuracy, accuracy of the lighting or the, uh, they adjust the lighting settings uh, to be appropriate for an exterior or an interior type of rendering. Um, there are, however, some advanced settings, which I'm going to go ahead and pull up. I'll show you how to get to that uh, advanced settings, uh, which will then later appear in this palette. So first, we need to go into Artlantis Preferences, um, which we'll pull up. And there's a little checkbox here. 
uh, which we will add a check to, that uh, tells it to display the expert rendering parameters. So uh, with that check, then we can go in back into the settings box, and we, we see an expanded palette of radiosity settings. So these give us um, additional settings um, that impact the way that light bounces around the project and, uh, and that sort of thing, and, and the amount of computing that Artlanus does uh, in the scene to calculate the shadows, which is what the radiosity is all about, you know, affecting those light qualities. So um, what I will do is I'm going to go ahead and jump into these uh, advanced rendering settings in depth to give you a, a better sense of what these rendering settings do, um, because uh, these settings are going to greatly affect both the appearance of your final rendering uh, in terms of the level of quality that uh, is achieved with the radiosity engine, and also uh, that uh, inversely proportional uh, relationship between the quality of the settings and the final uh, rendering time. Uh, so as you bump up the settings, of course, your rendering time is going to increase. So you need to be mindful of what these sliders do and how they impact the rendering time. Uh, and then set them accordingly. You don't want to go into overkill mode and put them all the way uh, up to the max when that's not necessary. So I'm going to jump back into Keynote. And uh, uh, Vince, if you can just make sure, let me know if this is coming up, up properly. I'm going to jump back in here and um, yeah. continue on. Yeah, the I'm only show you are some. Just one second. The only thing is uh, there's a little bit of lag, a little more is than there? usual. Um, okay. So if you could just, you know, I don't know, slow down a little bit in between, sure. uh, you know, between switching points. Between. Yeah, yeah, I think sure. that'd be great. Cool. Okay, I'd be happy to do that. Oh, I guess I missed my overview here. We're going to, uh, just today, time of line, we're going to talk about our, you know, rendering parameters. We're going to talk about the different settings and the perspectives, parallel views, animations, quick time VRs. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk about um, batch rendering application, which is included with Artlanus, and your export formats. Um, so let's jump right into uh, what I was talking about with the advanced rendering parameters. And um, starting with the accuracy settings, there's two sliders for accuracy settings, um, one being the long range uh, computations. Uh, so let's talk about that um, and go into what that's all about. Um, the long range calculates um, kind of a matrix uh, across the image. So Artlanus is um, uh, computing the uh, the shadows between um, these this grid that's defined. So there's a setting, uh, a range of options from 96 to 8. So if we define a, a set it to 96, it's going uh, it's basically dividing the image up into a 96 by 96 pixel grid and doing the computations there. As we reduce it um, to a, a smaller grid, a tighter grid, then it's uh, doing more analysis of the image, a tighter grid, and looking at those, uh, looking at the properties of light uh, in, a, in a tighter matrix, which of course is going to add uh, time to your rendering. Um, so you know, the higher the value, if we set it to 96, the fewer sample points uh, that are going to be calculated in the rendering. The tighter the grid, the lower the, the long range setting, the more computation uh, that uh, Artlanus has to crunch through in order to, uh, to get to the finished product. Um, on this interior view, I'm going to zoom into uh, an area of the project, which was that, uh, that toy that was sitting on the floor. And we're going to talk about some of the areas in here uh, that are um, impacted by indirect lighting. In other words, these are areas that aren't receiving direct lighting in the scene. Uh, Chris, I gotta, are... I gotta, I yes, gotta stop you there. I don't know. It seems like it's uh, frozen. The video, the audio is fine. It's coming in great, mm -hmm. but the video, okay. or the the visual, um, it seems to be frozen in between the PowerPoint and the your desktop image. And okay, uh, all I don't right, know. let me. Uh... Let's see what I can do about that. Let's jump out of here real fast. Uh, can you see what I'm? Uh, what's displaying on my screen? Um, no, it's stuck on a slide um, from the PowerPoint, and then it's sort of, you know, okay, blocked shall I just off. Stop showing the screen and then jump back on. Um, yeah, I think try that okay. maybe. Let's do that. Right. Okay. Oh. Start again. We'll see if that clears up the snag.
Is this better? Yeah, I think I think that yeah, I think that's a lot better. Okay, okay. cool. Oh, you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll just stick to kind of showing the PowerPoint in the uh, in the preview mode, and we won't go into the full screen because that's clearly uh, creating some problems. So yeah, okay. I'll, I'll just explain uh, what I was about to explain here, and yeah, uh, sorry go about into, that. Uh, uh, that. No, that's quite all right. So what we've got here is uh, this. Uh, uh, we, we jump from this view of the scene, which you know I talked about the uh, how the long range calculation works, and then we jump into a tighter view of uh, this particular uh, perspective, and we're, we're going to go on into some of the areas of the uh, view that are receiving indirect lighting and not much direct lighting, because that's where um, the calculations uh, for the short range are going to kick in, and uh, we can define uh, areas of uh, higher quality. Uh, so, uh, let me just talk about uh, uh, this by way of giving you an example uh, rendering. So, what we have here, um, and I think uh, you won't see the difference because of the way the slide was set up, but uh, this would be, uh, the difference here would be, um, uh, we have less shading going on in here, which is obscured by this red uh, uh, graphic here. Uh, as we refine and in increase the uh, values for the short range, um, you'll see an area of, of more refined shading, uh, darker, deeper, richer um, uh, values being applied to those, those areas of indirect light. So the short range impacts the calculations there. Um, on a slider going from, I believe, uh, 0 to 48. Uh, so um, if the short range slider is set to 0, you're going to have no short range calculation being done. You're going to have very washed out uh, shaded areas where there's indirect lighting. As you increase that by a close to 48, uh, you're going to increase the amount of uh, time calculated on the short range uh, lighting, uh, which will then improve the quality, but then of course, also increase the rendering time. So um, just to recap on uh, long range and short range, uh, the lower the value used on the long range, the tighter the grid, the more computations going on. Uh, and then also with the short range, the higher the value there, uh, the more it's doing to calculate and refine the shadows in the areas where there's indirect lighting. Uh, Chris, I gotta jump in one last time. Sorry about this. Yep, go ahead. Um, some people are saying that maybe if you turn the background slideshow off, it might help the uh, sure. the rate. I'll do that real fast. Okay, just choose something simple. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we'll see. And is that good? Yeah, okay, we'll, good. that helps. Okay. All right. So, and, and so finally, I'll show you uh, a range of examples here um, where we have uh, uh, computed the rendering um, using a range of different settings. So this first slide, um, and we're, we're going to have to kind of ignore it for this business here, or I can just get rid of it, I guess. Um, is uh, showing uh, the long, uh, we've got a long range setting of 96 and uh, short range of 4. So you can see uh, this is a kind of a minimal um, setting, a very average low impact setting, um, uh, what we call the normal setting, um, where very little is being done in the, those areas of indirect lighting and a very large grid is being used for the long range to compute uh, the, the radiosity. How's the screen doing? Are we okay? Vince? Yeah, it's, uh, it's working okay. good. So yeah, that's perfect. Okay, good. All right, so in the second view, we've, uh, we've uh, tightened the grid on the long range, and then we have uh, in, bumped up the short range uh, to uh, levels. Uh, we're talking about a 64 by 64 pixel grid on the long range, and a 16 uh, value of 16 used for the short range. So you can see uh, the difference between the two slides uh, going from the, the low-end settings to the mid-grade settings is pretty dramatic. And then if we go into the third rendering, we'll see that um, with this, uh, an even uh, tighter grid is used of, uh, of uh, I believe, uh, 32. Uh, and then also we've increased the short range uh, to 32, so we have an even more refined 
set of values uh, in those indirect lighted areas. So I don't know if I can jump through these really quickly just so you can see uh, the increase in the quality, uh, which of course increases your rendering time. Um, so that, uh, the long and short range uh, are primarily useful for interior type rendering applications. Uh, so that's part of the story in Artlantis, but then uh, we also have a different set of accuracy settings in Artlantis uh, under lighting, uh, which um, uh, help to differentiate different uh, conditions for the, the, the rays that bounce around the project, and you can set up different uh, types of views or different settings for interior versus exterior. So I'm going to jump into uh, an exterior uh, situation. We'll talk about um, what those settings are and what they do. So uh, there are, as I mentioned, four settings in here. First bounce, next bounces, attenuation, and color bleeding, each with a, a slider associated with them. And so if we jump into the, the keynote here, uh, the first bounce is the ray of the sun. Uh, it controls the base of the light ray that extends from the sun to the first surface that the, the sun's uh, light strikes. And so um, this slider will affect uh, basically the power of the, the reflected light uh, coming off that ray as it bounces off and scatters uh, around the scene. Uh, so we have, uh, jumping back into our Atlantis here, we've got uh, a slider. So the first bounce, as you bump up uh, this slider, uh, you're going to bump up the intensity uh, of that uh, that light ray as it as it uh, comes from the sun and bounces. Uh, then the next bounces control what the light does after it hits that first surface and reflects onto additional surfaces. Uh, so that second slider, uh, right here we've got values for, again from 1 to 16, which control the amount of reflected lights uh, traveling to and bouncing off to other surfaces. Um, in the scene. So by bumping that up or down, we can uh, increase or decrease the amount of uh, reflected light in, in the scene. And then finally, uh, attenuation uh, is the third slider. Uh, not finally, it's the third slider, uh, which controls um, the kind of the brightness of the shaded areas, um, uh, how much light is being absorbed by the surfaces uh, in the scene. So uh, if we set a very low attenuation value, then most of the light is being absorbed and very little of it is reflecting up onto other surfaces. So we won't see much of impact of the light ray coming to here and then bouncing up to this canopy, uh, for example. Uh, and then finally, color, color bleeding, uh, light, uh, when it hits a surface, now of course it's a black and white image, so it, or a grayscale image, so it really doesn't show color information, but you know, if we had a, let's say, a painted green building surface, if we turn up the color bleeding, then as that light bounces upward, we're going to see a green cast coming off of the light rays that are reflected from the building surface, that green building surface, to uh, the canopy overhead. So that's what color bleeding does uh, for your light rays. So um, again, uh, I'll show some examples of the differences here uh, in the renderings, if I can get some of this information off the screen. Uh, so let's see here. I may not be able to grab that. I'm not going to worry about it. So this is uh, your uh, kind of a basic setting here, um, where um, we have used uh, what is the typical uh, exterior preset for the scene, and, and this is dealing with conditions that are typically best suited to an exterior environment, um, large buildings, big volumes, you're not worried about a lot of detail in the shadow because most of those elements uh, are going to be far enough away from the camera where that is not much of a concern. Um, so uh, then we proceed on to um, the second example, which um, has bumped up the, uh, some of the settings there. Uh, for better suited for an interior application, but just to give you an idea of the difference, you can see that uh, we have a, a little more clarity in some of the reflected surfaces. They're brighter, and if I can do the comparison, and hopefully your screens track with that. So here's scene one uh, with a, an exterior, basic exterior uh, preset used, uh, and then uh, scene two, which shows uh, more of that uh, light bouncing around and, and casting and, and uh, reflecting onto the additional surfaces where indirect lighting comes into play. 
And then uh, a third uh, view just showing those uh, settings pretty much maxed out uh, to give you a sense of you know, how far you can take this. And, and really, um, when you're looking at um, the settings for both uh, accuracy and lighting and, and knowing that um, these play into the calculation time, uh, you want to kind of stick with uh, settings that are going to be appropriate uh, for the type of view you're creating and use that as a starting point. Um, you know, for example, we're, we have an exterior view here, and let me change this back to 800. And uh, we, you know, we want to use the exterior preset. We'll probably just use the normal accuracy setting. Um, um, and uh, we wouldn't really need to adjust any of these values unless we notice, for example, it's, you know, we feel in our estimation that the, uh, the light under the roof, for example, is too dark, and we might adjust the... Uh, next bounce to address that issue. So if we bump it all the way up, just to give you an extreme example, you can see how the preview window is now showing uh, a much lighter surface under the roof surface because a lot of the reflected light in the scene is bouncing up and um, increasing the light level under that uh, surface. Now, uh, you don't uh, confuse this with, uh, you know, uh, adjusting the sun's power. But, uh, obviously, I didn't do anything to change the sun's power um, it's still at a constant setting, so it means most of the uh, general lighting conditions are going to remain the same, but we have addressed excuse me, the issue of how the light bounces around the scene, so that, that in particular, that, uh, uh, this slider will affect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, click the render button just to get uh, a rendering uh, queued up. Let's talk briefly about the, uh, the options that are available here. We, we briefly skimmed over this, but let's talk more in depth. With the uh, still perspective renderings that are uh, available in Artlantis, let me see, I'll get out of this dialogue here for a second. Um, let me go back in there. Um, you have uh, several different um, formats available to you, JPEG, DMP, uh, Targa or TGA, PICT, PNG, TIFF, and these, uh, these four here include uh, some degree of uh, alpha channel information. Then you get into Photoshop, uh, which offers its own unique um, options uh, if you choose that as the rendering output from Artlantis and Piranesi. So I'll talk about more, the, uh, more about those in just a second. Um, you also have the option of um, either rendering now uh, or queuing it up to be rendered later and you would use the Artlantis batch application, which is a separate application included with Artlantis uh, that can run in the background and enable you to produce a series of renderings while you're continuing to work in Artlantis or do something else. Uh, and it doesn't have quite the same overhead that Artlantis has with its real-time 3D preview window and all the other uh, bells and whistles and, and uh, uh, dialogues that appear in Artlantis. So it's a kind of a low impact uh, Lean, mean rendering machine, Artlantis batch. Um, and then you have your options, which we saw um, and we accessed uh, up here in this gear. Uh, so we can go in and tweak anything before we do the final rendering. If we want to bump up some sliders, we can do it here as well. We can also save any of these settings as uh, default settings to apply across uh, a variety of different perspectives. Now, it's important to note that these settings in here under rendering parameters uh, I'll go ahead and, and queue, up, uh, queue this up to render later. Uh, these settings are, are independently controlled for each different perspective. So I can go in and set up a series of rendering parameters for a, a bunch of exterior views and then go into some interior views and um, tweak those to have different settings so I can switch those to the interior so you can see that each each perspective in Artlantis has its own set of uh, preset rendering parameters. Okay, let's see. So after we've set all of the rendering settings and options, um, we're you know ready to render. Now uh, I mentioned briefly that you have some options for uh, exporting as a, a Photoshop file or a Piranesi file. So let's talk about those real briefly. With the Piranesi, um, Piranesi is a, a rendering, a separate rendering application that uh, excels at creating sort of artistic or hand-drawn uh, looking renderings, which is really its strong suit. It do also does photorealistic, but uh, I think Artlantis is the better package for photorealistic renderings. But we have this option to export 
uh, Piranesi file formats, which gives you um, the ability, uh, the unique ability in Piranesi to have depth information mapped uh, with that rendering as well as the actual rendering information. So it, it, you, once you take that into the Piranesi environment, you can apply materials to the surfaces because that additional information related to the surfaces is saved with the file. Um, also, in, under the Photoshop option, uh, this will save out a, a, your, your typical Photoshop file. And I'll, um, rather than going into the, the uh, keynote, let's just uh, open a Photoshop file in Atlantis, I mean, I'm sorry, in Photoshop that was rendered with Atlantis, um, just to give you an idea of uh, what that is all about. So if we open that in Photoshop, take just a second for Photoshop to come up, what you're going to get are four different layers of information in Photoshop um, that uh, give you the ability, I don't know if you can see the layers palette or not, um, maybe I'll move that over, can you see that okay? Everybody seen Photoshop? Yeah, I mean it's it's coming up on my continuing here. Yeah. Okay, good, great. So, um, so this is the Artlandis rendering, and you'll see that we've got um, four layers in here. One is the model itself, the rendering, uh, and as you can see here, there is an alpha channel saved with that. Um, that gives you additional information about the scene. So you can see there's a grayscale map that basically masks out the background in the scene. Um, so that gives you real quick access to that in case you wanted to change, a, let's say, a background within the uh, Photoshop environment. Uh, then you have the background itself, which is on a separate layer. And uh, if we take those layers away, well, actually, let's just turn on the background layer. So there's the background. Um, then we have a material layer, which, through the use of unique colors, uh, differentiates each of the materials that existed in Artlantis. So it gives you a real quick and easy way to select a certain material in the, the Photoshop environment. And finally, we have an object layer, which distinguishes or differentiates the objects that you're viewing in uh, the scene uh, to give you a quick way to select those as well. Um, so that's the, the full gamut of the options in Photoshop. Uh, which is, again, just created right from Artlantis. Uh, so now let's move into um, some of the other um, options available to you, the other rendering types available in Artlantis. So we've discussed the perspective views and what those are about. Let's talk about the parallel views in Artlantis. So parallel views are um, typically elevation or plan views of a building. Um, and they are used, of course, in architectural drawings or renderings that uh, need to be done to scale. And you'll notice if we pull up the rendering parameters for this particular uh, parallel view we have selected, you do, in fact, have a scale option here. Uh, there are several different presets, or you can go in and, and define your own uh, scale option. So if you want to put this uh, a scaled view of your project in a, a, drawing, a set of drawing documents, then you can do that very easily. Uh, using this option. Uh, you also have the ability to set up the resolution. Probably now is a good time to talk about the resolution uh, quickly and what that means in Artlantis. Now Artlantis, when it renders something, it, it renders it at 72 dpi, no exceptions. It's always set to 72 dpi. So why do we have this resolution box in here? What is, what is its purpose? Let's just, uh, by way of example, type in an, uh, a different number and then tab to the next field, you'll see what it actually is doing is acting as a calculator uh, such that if you type in a different resolution, it's going to bump up the uh, width uh, and height of the project or the render, rendering that's about to be rendered. Uh, so it's basically just being used as a calculator to scale up the uh, ultimate resolution, the final resolution of the rendering. Uh, when you open that in a photo editing application like Photoshop, you will uh, then go in and if you want to scale the image or set it to a different print resolution, let's say you want to bump it up to 300 dpi, you would do it in that photo editing application. So really this is just a calculation tool for you. Uh, you have a lot of the same uh, options for the parallel views as you had with the perspectives in terms of the radiosity, the accuracy and lighting settings, um, anti-aliasing, uh, so those are, are very similar, nothing new to discuss there. Um, we'll go ahead and OK this. And uh, we'll go ahead and queue up a rendering for uh, parallel views. 
So if we click render, uh, again you have the same file format options as you did with the perspective views and the same options uh, show up here under the advanced rendering parameters. We'll go ahead and set this to render later. We're just going to save this in the same folder where the project is and click the render later button. So what we're doing here as I go through these different tools uh, is we are queuing up a series of uh, renderings that will be handled by batch render at the end of the presentation. Uh, okay, so let's go into um, the next option here, which is Animation Inspector. Now this is getting into the features of Artlantis Studio. Now there are two different versions of Artlantis. There's Artlantis Render, which just does the still views and the uh, parallel views. And then there's Artlantis Studio, which does uh, movie style animations, walk through, fly through animations, as well as um, object VRs and panoramic VRs. So let's talk about the uh, standard animations and uh, what's available there. You'll notice a new palette uh, popped up when I switched to the Animations Inspector. This is your Animation Palette or your Timeline Palette. And for each sequence you have that you set up in Artlantis, it's going to appear on the timeline. So you can see the first sequence occupies a certain space in time. And then the next sequence in the queue here occupies another, uh, an additional set of time further down the timeline. So each sequence uh, has its own time settings. Um, you have a number of different controls. Now, the purpose of this uh, presentation is not to really go in depth on the animation. That's the purpose of another uh, presentation. But I will uh, just indicate that um, within this, uh, uh, these controls here, you have the ability to um, move the timeline backwards and forwards. I just click this uh, button here. These are kind of familiar controls for navigating a VCR, for example, or uh, the playback uh, controls on a remote, and they appear here in Atlantis. I clicked on the back button to rewind to the beginning of this sequence. So my red uh, icon indicates that's where I am at the beginning of the sequence. And I can, I'm not sure how this is going to translate over the web, but I can preview the animation by clicking this play button. And you'll see uh, an OpenGL rendering of the project happening in real time. I'm not sure how well that's translating uh, to you across the web. Uh, but in Artlandish, you can preview animations in real time to uh, ensure that the sequence has been properly uh, laid out. You're not you know, moving through walls or anything unusual. And you can also gauge kind of the timing of the, the pacing of movement as well. <clears throat> um, let's go ahead and uh, click the rendering button and talk about the different options that are available to you in animations. Um, you have QuickTime Movie Format on Mac and Windows. On Windows, you also have the addition of the AVI file format, which is not available if you're on a Macintosh, which I am. Um, so those are your two standard movie formats, movie file formats. And then you also have JPEG and Targa or TGA file formats, which will uh, essentially render a sequence or a series of separate still images uh, for the entire animation. So they'll just appear as a series of files, and you can uh, stitch them together in uh, something like QuickTime Pro or, or, or different uh, animation or movie editing software to uh, put them all together in a single movie if you want to compile them that way. Uh, the JPEG file format compresses the image. The TGA file format does not. Uh, you, again, have the familiar controls of the rendering parameters, which also apply to animations. So you can set those up, again, independently for each rendering sequence if you want, animation sequence. Um, you also have codecs here. There are a number of different popular codecs available. Probably about the best one is the H.264, which is about the newest. Uh, offers the best trade-off between quality and size for your animation, so that's a good one to stick to. You also have a quality slider, so if you bump it up, you'll max out the quality, and of course you'll increase the size of the animation file, the movie file. If you drop it down, you reduce the size of the file, but of course the quality will get uh, progressively worse. <laughs> um, so you want to kind of keep it probably mid-grade or higher depending on what you're trying to do with a broadcast or a web. Um, and then finally, uh, you have, of course, you're always telling it where to save the file. We're going to go ahead and click the Render Later button and render this animation later. And then I'll jump on to the next type of rendering option, which is the Object VR. Now, uh, again, 
this is, uh, I won't go too in depth on this uh, because this is the purpose of a, you know, this would be a more focused <laughs> in the animation uh, presentation we talk about uh, object uh, VRs. But I will talk about again the settings tier, again, independently configurable settings. You've seen those where you can configure the quality settings uh, for each uh, object VR view. Um, let's go ahead and click the render uh, button. And again, you'll see your file format options, same as what you saw with the animations. Same codec options, so largely the same. We'll click render later and we'll save an object VR. Uh, I will, I think, at least briefly describe what an object VR is in case you are unfamiliar with what it is. Basically, it just gives you a kind of a fly around view of the model. This is, I, I'm not actually navigating an object VR, but this is very similar to what you would be able to do with an object VR which is to be able to grab a spot on the model and then spin the model around and view it from different vantage points. Again, I'm not quite sure, based on our connection, how well that's uh, coming across the screen, but that's, in effect, what you can do with an object VR movie. Um, and then finally, we'll move into the panoramic uh, VR movies. Uh, this is one area that has been greatly improved with the new release of Artlantis version 4. And I'll briefly describe uh, what your options are again there. Now, again, you're seeing a lot of the same uh, settings. Uh, you do have the ability to adjust your focal setting to kind of create a zoomed in or zoomed out appearance uh, to the uh, camera or the view. Uh, again, under the rendering settings, the same familiar interface for uh, accuracy and lighting and so forth to adjust the quality sliders. Um, I guess I should also mention what, while I'm on the subject that you can within each view uh, set up uh, different suns. You can save different sun settings in Artlantis as, and then give them names. Uh, so each view can choose a different sun if you want to. Uh, different light configurations can be chosen uh, and so on and so forth, different layers. Let's go ahead and render. Now this is new. In version 4 of Artlantis, uh, Artlantis 4, the release of Artlantis 4 also came with the announcement of iVisit 3D, which is a separate application uh, and the separate the function of Artlantis um, that enables you to save panoramic VR movies. And for the first time in Artlantis since the version 1 came out around 2005, you have the ability to create connected VR panoramic movies. So that is VR, basically a VR presentation where you can set up different cameras through the model and connect those cameras together. So you'll be able to jump through different points in the model space and view the panoramic view at that location. You have only one format option, which is HTML. So gone are the QuickTime VR panoramic movies. We don't offer that anymore in Artlantis. Instead, we have an HTML option, which basically creates a series of JPEG images. And through the use of Flash, um, enables you to view those images in any web browser. So this is, uh, to I think most people's way of thinking, the way things are headed in the future. You're going to be able to share your VR panoramic movies over the web uh, or uh, just send the, the presentation to a client and when they click on it, they'll open it up in their web browser and be able to um, navigate through the, the project uh, through these uh, panoramic VR movies. I'll go ahead and render later, again to queue up um, the rendering of uh, the panoramic VR. And if I can, I'm going to uh, jump in here and pull up a sample of a panoramic uh, VR movie just to give you an idea of what that's like. Uh, it'll take a second for it to load up. Gives you the iVisit iV 3D logo. And now we're in the project viewing a panoramic VR. And just by simply clicking and dragging in the scene, I can spin around the scene and, and view it from any angle at that specific uh, camera location. And you can see other cameras uh, visible in the scene. I can see that and just click on it and jump to that spot and then view uh, the project from that particular camera perspective. We can also pull up the plan view and see the camera views indicated on the plan. And I can jump to a different camera on the plan interface. Now I'm outside on the terrace, and I can spin around and view the project from any vantage point at that location. We can also mouse down near the bottom of the screen and pull up thumbnail images of the different panoramas that are available um, in that uh, rendered scene. 
So now I will quickly jump into back into our Atlantis and, and discuss uh, the batch rendering. Uh, we've queued up all these different uh, uh, types of renderings, and you can see them now, both their, uh, the project associated with uh, the renderings as well as the rendering type and some settings. We can go in and delete or rearrange uh, different uh, the order of the renderings. Um, when we're satisfied with this, then we pull up the Artlantis batch application, which is right here. And you're going to see that same listing or dialog showing you the list of queued up renderings uh, as soon as that pulls up. And it, it, assuming we're satisfied with this list and ready to roll, uh, we can click the render button to start the batch rendering process. Uh, so uh, at any point in time, we can quit the batch rendering and basically freeze the rendering process uh, to resume at a later time if we want. I'm going to go ahead and quit it right now. Um, since we don't have much time here. And um, let's see, I don't think there's much else to, to talk about in terms of rendering. This just gives you a real quick overview of uh, some of the options. I, what you can do, uh, there are some export formats available in Artlantis, which I guess is probably worth talking about. We've got DWF, OBJ, SKP. Um, so you can save your Atlantis projects uh, in these different formats for the, then translation opening in some you know, other application if you so desire. Uh, so those options are available to you. I'll jump ahead to the screen in my keynote that talks about um, the different file formats that are available, saving formats in Atlantis, which we kind of discussed there real quickly. Uh, you can also archive your Atlantis project, which will include all the media with the project useful. Uh, or when you want to open the project years later and make sure everything that was in the project is still there. Your rendering formats, which we discussed, your movie formats. Um, so I'd like to close the presentation by just clicking through some different renderings. Hopefully these won't, uh, or you'll be able to see these um, on your screen. And these are just renderings done by uh, users in the Artlantis community. Uh, and these have all come from the user gallery on artlantis.com. Just to give you a feel for uh, some of the, uh, the quality uh, achievable in Artlantis. Now these, of course, were all done with Artlantis 3. Artlantis 4 is brand new. Um, and I apologize for the, the keynotes uh, solution not working. I'll, I'll work on the next time I do a presentation uh, shoring that up if I can. Uh, so I, I guess at this point I, I'm uh, happy to open it to any of your questions. Yeah, uh, great. We'll just get to a couple here. Uh, first quick one here from Garvin. Uh, what version of Artlantis were you using for the tutorial? Uh, for this presentation today, I was using Artlantis 4, uh, which is available on artlantis.com. You can download it and run it as a 30-day demo for free. If you decide you like Artlantis, you can purchase the full version and unlock that demo with a serial number. Okay, cool. We, yeah, I just want to throw this out there, too. We also have it. Um, through the Noveg website as well, so whatever you know, That's whatever correct. suits yes. your preference. Um, mm -hmm. So here's here's another one we'll jump into. Jim was wondering, why doesn't Atlantis allow for a bigger preview window greater than 1200? In his situation, he uses two 21-inch monitors that have plenty of real estate for a preview uh, window. I see what you mean. Uh, I guess uh, I, I think there might, and I'm just grasping here. I don't know the the answer from a developer's point of view, and that's probably who you'd want to ask that question to, but I'm assuming it has to do with uh, the overhead, and they just had to make sort of an arbitrary decision that a size is larger than that would tend to bog the software down. I don't know if that's the real answer, but I'm assuming it has to do with kind of your speed hit. You'll notice in Artlantis, particularly when you're in uh, uh, animation, animation Inspector, and you preview animations there, uh, Artlantis will often switch to uh, an OpenGL view, and, and or you may not even be able to preview the animation at all. So you do there is a speed hit as the size goes up, the size goes up, and I assume that's uh, why that decision is made. Okay, cool. Um, here's Kevin's got a couple questions, and I think a lot of them deal with uh, compatibility and workflow with VectorWorks. Um, mm -hmm. I guess if you could just talk a little bit about the the flow, you know importing from VectorWorks into Atlantis and vice versa, um, some of the benefits you see, I guess? Sure. Yeah, um, 
I'll just point this out. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys at, at Novich have the, the plugins on your website or not. We don't have them on our website. I was just online. But uh, you can get uh, export plugins for Artlantis um, on artlantis.com in the download section. Uh, so in, in particular with Vectorworks, there aren't plugins available yet, export plugins available for Vectorworks uh, specifically for Artlantis 4.0. Now, if we pull up 3.0, point out, of course there are, and I expect uh, within fairly short order, within maybe a period of weeks or, or maybe a month or two, hopefully sooner than that, they'll have the Vectorworks plugins available for Atlas 4.0. Now what the, the export plugins do is give you the ability to export your project uh, directly from Vectorworks in this case. Uh, into an Artlantis project format, the ATL format, which is the, the file format that Artlantis uses for its projects. And <clears throat> generally, when you use an export uh, plugin, you're, you're going to get some options up front uh, about how Artlantis handles certain things uh, being exported. For example, how materials are treated on the export, how layers are treated, um, how cameras and lights are treated. Uh, and, and oftentimes, uh, not all export uh, plugins are the same, but <clears throat> you may get options for um, uh, uh, pointing to a reference file. So if you've done uh, previous work on this project in Artlantis, you can point to a reference file, uh, which is you know, basically the previous version of the project, and pull in uh, uh, work you've done on the materials or the cameras or the lights. So that stuff you've set up specifically in the Artlantis environment can, can get merged in with your project you're exporting from Vectorworks. I'm not 100% sure whether the Vectorworks export plugin gives you those features or not. I know some of the other ones do. Um, uh, but at any rate, uh, it gives you kind of a shortcut to certain things that uh, uh, you wouldn't necessarily have if you just open up, let's say, an OBJ file in Artlantis or a DWG file in Artlantis. Um, so it, it gives you kind of a shortcut to getting your project in and getting productive with it. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's that's super helpful. Um, I just want to throw this out there too that we do have the plugins available through Novage. So if Great. anyone's interested, sure. um, they're on our product page, and I believe they actually are part of the software bundle that we sell that includes Artlantis. So um, yeah, I mean, I'll, we'll we'll talk more about that later. Let's just we'll try to get some more mm -hmm. questions here. Sure. Um, here's one. Here's one about Photoshop. Uh, Robert was wondering, does the Photoshop option save layers that can be used in Photoshop? Yeah, uh, the example I pulled up, and I think I've closed Photoshop. Um, let's pull it up real, here real fast. Uh, it gives you the same basic four layers for any rendering you create in Artlantis. It gives you the model, uh, which, as you can see, is the model itself, excluding the background. Uh, and there is an alpha channel. If we disable that alpha channel, uh, then you're going to see... Uh, you know, basically the model uh, excluding the, the background. So we'll turn that back on. Uh, then there's the background itself, the material channel, again, giving you the ability to select by color, easily select materials by these color-coded options here, and then uh, the object layer. And did I answer the question? Was there anything, uh, anything else to it I, I may have missed? Those are the, those are the basic layers. Uh, you can add, of course, it, it, is a, it is a real Photoshop file at this point, so you can add as many new layers as you want to it. You can layer in plants or people or whatever kind of entourage you want to add to the scene and that kind of thing. Um, you can put in additional effects for whatever lens flares, whatever, you know, even though Artlands do that, you can also do that in Photoshop, of course. Okay, cool. That, that, that answers it pretty well. Um, I think we'll just get to one more question here because um, we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Here's, here's Chris is wondering, is there a way to remove the infinite ground Black Horizon when rendering? To remove the infinite ground Black Horizon? Yeah, he put that in a yeah. parentheses. A second here. Let's get to a, a view that might show the infinite ground. Let's see here. We'll jump to this and we'll just uh, navigate around. Okay, so I, I believe this project <coughs> has infinite ground set up. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, let's find out. Whoops. My place here. Uh, 
Uh, missing my infinite ground. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of forgetting where it is, but I know it's here. Oh, there it is. Um, under Scene Information, uh, you have this pull-down option here uh, where you can toggle infinite ground on or off. So uh, this may be what, what the person is referring to, what Chris is referring to. Uh, if this is unchecked, then you're going to see that black uh, background. If, it, if you check it, then you're going to see whatever shader you define as being used for the infinite ground material. Okay, so that's that's basically what you do there. So um, I, hopefully I've answered the question. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I think that's that's great. I think uh, unfortunately we'll have to stop there. Um, apologize to anyone who didn't get their question answered. It's just we're running a little short on time here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I just want to switch back to my screen here and we'll uh, wrap things up. Great. So cool. Again, thank you, Chris. Tremendous presentation. I'm sure everyone out there found it as fascinating as I did. Um, and yeah, and again, I want to thank everyone who attended this presentation of No Badge's Best of the Best webinar series. Just a little background on No Badge, in case any of you are unfamiliar. We're the leading online design software superstore. Not only do we have the best prices around, but our staff is extremely knowledgeable, and you can call, chat with us at any time. Again, we do have the latest version of Atlantis and all the plugins available on our on our website through our product page. So feel free to check that out if you have any questions at all. Um, another little bit of information I'd like to bring your attention to is a vector working shown here on your screen. Um, it's basically an online community that we've designed to help foster the collaboration and communication between design professionals. I want to stress that it's not just a Vectorworks only community. We have a ton of Artlantis members. We keep a lot of information about Artlantis, um, videos, tutorials, events, news, um, trends. This webinar will also be made available on Vectorworking. So if any of you want to view it again, it's free, it's easy to sign up. Um, just head over there and you can check it out. Additionally, we'll be sending everyone an email with a link to the, uh, the webinar if they want to view it that way. Um, so yeah, again, if anyone has any questions at all, feel free to contact me. My email is Vince at NoVeg.com. And uh, I put up our Atlantis sales rep, Bob, at NoVeg.com. Uh, he handles all of our Atlantis sales. He's just extremely knowledgeable, as I said. Um, he would love to hear from you if you have any questions. Um, yeah, feel free to talk to him. So, yeah, I think having said all that, Chris, did you want to add anything right before we sign off here? Uh, not really. I, uh, just be sure to check NoVeg's website and artlantis.com for all the latest uh, information on version 4, which, as I said, just came out. So there's a lot of new things, uh, really great improvements. It's worth uh, taking a look at and, and seeing what they are. I didn't even barely scratch the surface of what's available in version 4, so uh, take the time to do that. I think you'll, you'll find it worthwhile. And thank you, Vince, for, for allowing me to, to do this presentation today. Yeah, again, thank you, Chris. Fortunately, you know, we just don't have enough time. Uh, otherwise, we'd love to cover more, you know. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Or I guess we'll have to schedule another one soon here. All right, sounds good. Okay, so everyone uh, take care. We'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Vince.